So I'm going to introduce our second speaker, who is Professor Bogdan Dragonski, a native Bulgarian and consultant neurologist at the Department of Clinical Neuroscience at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, and is the director of the Neuroimaging Laboratory and of the de Departmental MRI platform. So after qualifying in clinical neurology in Germany, he spent time working on computational anatomy research in neurodegenerative and movement disorder at the Institute of Neurology at UCL London. And he also worked at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Science at Leipzig, Germany. Uh, so with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Dragonski and invite him to uh, start sharing his slide. Thank you very much, Aurélie. And um, uh, let me see. OK. Good. Uh, just give me, please, a thumbs up if you see my slides. And given the short amount of time, I'll um, directly go into it. Thanks again for having me. My name is Bogdan Dragansky, and I am here in Lausanne, in Switzerland. And after Martina laid the theoretical grounds, I can just jump on her shoulders and do the easy part of it, uh, namely how actually uh, we um, acquire data, the way how she described it, and what for in the context of aging. That means I'll be talking about the added value of uh, quantitative MRI for studying the aging brain. And when thinking about the presentation, I thought I'll uh, present you more a chronological um, type of, of, of journey, um, how we started back in time uh, at the UCL with, with this idea and how it developed further. Um, well, I mean, let's look at the facts um, of, of, of aging. And we know the population of the world is aging. And if you can see here on this, on this picture, um, it's actually not only Europe um, affected by um, the higher numbers of the aging population. It's much more the other continents you see in Asia and Africa. We have much more um, this um, extraordinary increase in the numbers of um, individuals uh, that uh, surpass the age of, of 65. This, of course, poses enormous socioeconomic challenges and particularly in the context then of all aging related uh, disorders. Um, and of course, we have to ask ourselves the question. This was also what Martina was implying in her um, sentence about aging and neurodegeneration. What is actually healthy aging? Can we assume that all these declining curves in terms of physical strength, in terms of cognitive um, also performance is indeed healthy? Is, it, is aging at all a disease? Um, and, um, and how do we actually um, differentiate it from pathological conditions, be it neurodegenerative or uh, vascular nature? Because I'm a clinician, um, I, my motivation studying aging is exactly this, as depicted in this very colorful uh, picture of an initiative here in Europe that I'm uh, proud to be part of. And at cellular level, at systems level, you can imagine our young and not that young lives following a very clean uh, blue stream. And in certain um, moment, um, there are some deviations where you see here these explosions in different colors um, that are associated, of course, with certain genetic predisposition, but of course, with the um, effects of environment um, are leading us to, to different disorders. And there we can, of course, see neurodegenerative and psychiatric disorders, et cetera, et cetera. That means we want to understand, we want to describe what healthy aging is in order then to eventually prevent or intercept diseases. Then let's take the journey chronologically. I was very fortunate in my career to work with one of the icons in the field, Richard Frakowiak, and like all the stars in the field, he has an insanely high number of publications with, of course, insanely high numbers of um, citations. But what I was discovering recently, really by chance, when looking through his profile and, 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 and citations, Please don't blame me that I'm not woke enough to know that citations and age index are not what um, excellence in science is. But look, his number one cited 
uh, publication is a voxel-based morphometric study of aging in 465 normal adult human brains. And this surpasses, of course, all the classics or fundamentals of of publications related to algorithms and techniques a bit on pre-processing or statistical analysis following afterwards that we're still using. You see, it has 160 citations per year. That's why I was telling myself, well, that's the way how you make it. Let it also be one of my questions in my research career. Um, well, the, the, the study was a classic one. I think at the time it was one of the biggest cohorts, as you can see, slightly skewed towards the younger population, but see all these, let's say, regions that you like, your primary sensory motor cortex, um, the gray matter decline over age, this inverted U-shape of um, changes in the white matter. Of course, there are some surprising here findings that the hippocampus and the thalamus are much more expanding over the age, but let's put this aside. But this was, let's say, something that laid the ground also for obviously um, different um, than studies with the interest in healthy aging and what I would describe also as a pathological aging. Um, the framework is since ever that's meet in the 90s the same we have a machine that produces um, a certain images um, and then using different techniques be it voxel based or surface based either probabilistic framework or not we're getting some metrics that we use in brain space for statistical analysis and then eventually we're getting our results and our questions answered well, my first actually intention when we talk about quantitative MRI and particularly the um, relaxometry implementation that Martina described so well was actually from a different perspective. When I saw these images, I thought, well, finally, we have a good contrast for these structures that I was so interested in, the basal ganglia. For the first time, for somebody who worked previously with T1-weighted images, I was able to see the pallidum, I was able to see substantia nigra, red nucleus, and so on. But being, of course, in the framework of SPM, my first problem was, well, I have obviously the contrast, but with the framework of, 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 of the tissue priors of SPM, I'm not that good into it. And therefore, with my uh, student, Sarah, we actually decided to try to enhance the um, existing uh, tissue probability maps for gray matter, of course, in a very simplistic way, um, where actually we want to introduce these new structures as also structures that we want actually to get uh, classified as gray matter. Because normally, if you work with, with two unweighted images, you will see that the structure of the pallidum will be inevitably, inevitably ending as a white matter structure. Same about substantia nigra, red nucleus, and so on. That means we had a sophisticated way with manual raters, of course, where we were looking through uh, a number of individuals. We decided for the transverse relaxation rate uh, images because they are so... Um, um, so well um, defining these iron-rich structures and, of course, the magnetization transfer saturation. And manually, we were actually entering subject by subject all these um, uh, delineations, slice per slice. Uh, and at the end of the day, we ended up with the so-called enhanced tissue priors, um, which um, actually give us um, the uh, chance to detect uh, these very structures. And you can see, I don't know, let's say, how big your screen is, but here in the enhanced tissue priors, we see here the substantia nigra parts of the subthalamic nucleus, the red nucleus, but also this structure of the pallidum, etc. And of course, when we just run the uh, simple voxel-based morphometry type of pre-processing and we compare very same brains um, pre-processed with the uh, existing tissue priors and with the ones enhanced for these structures. It's not a wonder. Um, these are exactly the areas that we were missing uh, in a normal anatomical sense um, uh, previously that uh, suddenly um, uh, come out. I've heard also from colleagues of mine that even using these enhanced tissue priors with um, T1-weighted imaging is still saving some of the voxels 
I don't know, depending on your question, if this, of course, will help you or not. But I think that was, let's say, my first um, contact with, with, with this type of data um, before we started talking about in vivo histology, etc. Therefore, I want to come back on this um, uh, to this framework, and I want just to um, um, again stress um, this importance of interpretation of our results, because in the sense of uh, interpretation, where clinically I expect loss of volume atrophy. When I see this with my voxel-based analysis in the statistical uh, proper way, the interpretation there is at hand. I mean, no one will question Alzheimer's disease and so on if I see loss of volume that VBM results are showing me this and this is the proper interpretation. But of course, being also aficionado of this idea of the plastic brain, etc., then the, the interpretation um, comes a little bit more difficult because we want what is then the neurobiological substrate of all these changes that we're seeing. And um, I will just repeat some of the, of the, of the, of the basics that um, Martina was showing. Of course, it's very easy always to assign to one contrast our interpretation, but let's not forget that um, whatever we are proposing here is not indeed, let's say, carved in stone well, the uh, longitudinal relaxation rate is um, um, a, a, a marker for myelin, because of course the, the truth is much more complex. And you saw also this um, sort of, for us, very uh, pleasing um, 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 ability to, to, to detect on a single brain, um, and this on the right is my brain, this of course um, uh, resembles what Martina was showing, but you see also on my brain, um, the distribution of, of, of intracortical myelin resembles what uh, fle flexic uh, shoulders um, back uh, 100 years back in time. Of course, we are very much fond of the idea of, of validating this with um, ex, in, uh, his, um, ex vivo histology. Um, I had this um, uh, sort of attempt many years ago, but for this, you need really the framework that I would say uh, you know, people like Nikolaus Weisskopf at the Max Planck Institute with Evgenia Kirillina are having. And then we're having now the first um, uh, proper validation of what we are claiming uh, from the modeling side of view in terms of interpretation of our result. Why is it important? Well, I mean, it's not a name and, 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 and blame and shame session here. This is the way how our research goes on. And you see, um, back in time, uh, in 2004, uh, we were all fascinated by these um, results uh, that were showing the loss of cortical thickness uh, between age 5 and 20. You see this blue area that expands from these primary sensory motor areas, eventually visual cortex, towards the prefrontal cortex. And this um, was, let's say, again, one of the so-called milestone studies convincing us that um, the biological substrate of the synaptic pruning or whatever, and indeed in this span of time, we're just losing uh, cortical thickness, which is biologically, in my opinion, not plausible. And this again, with the techniques that Martina and I'm trying to convince you are more reliable, um, 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 the colleagues around um, um, Nikolaus Weisskopf with uh, colleagues from the States showed very convincingly that um, at least for the visual cortex in this age span, uh, there is no loss of cortical thickness. It's much more the contrast in MR that is changing um, due to um, actually increase of intracortical myelin. You see, no one will, um, let's say, claim that the results are not correct, but I think our interpretation at the time was wrong, and now we know why. And this is what I think motivated us here in Lausanne to start um, collecting this type of data in the context of a longitudinal um, study. It's a monocentric uh, study on aging, namely healthy or pathological aging, because indeed, we want to look at lifetime trajectories. We want to see much more complex relationships in a sort of 
um, neurobiologically also informed way. Um, this is a very interesting study that started back in 2003. Um, it had the only uh, sort of inclusion criteria that um, it was focused here on the city of Lausanne and according to the uh, to the registry of, of citizens, it invited roughly 12,000 individuals at the time, which were aged between 35 and 75. It's a small city. That's why the 12,000 is the correct number. And as usual, on such initiatives, half of the individuals responded positively. And since 2003, where was the baseline assessment? They are seen every five years. Um, and with an astonishingly low drop um, um, out rate. And there is the so-called somatic examination where we look at all the possible cardiovascular risk factors. There is also a very smart psychiatric assessment, which is uh, using this uh, diagnostic inventory of genetic studies, which actually is um, a representing um, like decision tree um, according to different uh, domains questions yes and no when you answer with a no then you jump to the ne next question when yes you then go down the rabbit hole let's say that means at the end of the day you have a sparse matrix that you can run certain algorithms which are giving you actually the diagnosis which is um, um i think in a way although subjective because it's based on a questionnaire better than um, a diagnosis delivered by a white coat like me and since 2013, we started also inviting all these individuals to come uh, to our research um, uh, MRI uh, scanner. And then we got some good numbers. Um, during the first five years, we got 1,400 individuals. 1,200 of these came for a second time. Now we are running the third wave um, of, of these um, um, uh, participants. And of course, the first study that we uh, did was the aging study. Um, um, we wanted to make it, and I think what also Martina showed, um, indeed, the effects not only on volume of aging are uh, omnipresent. But what was astonishing to me when we asked the question, well, um, knowing that there is a global effect, if we correct for this global effect of, of age, where do we see um, uh, actually the much, much steeper decline or, or, or difference in uh, with age, then it was the primary motor cortex, which changed or let's say um, um, uh, um, correlated negatively, not only with volume, but you see in the very same region, there was a loss of myelin and loss of iron and increase in, in, in free water. And that was interesting because it's already giving you a, a hint uh, why we think already at that level, very simplistic, we are better off in terms of explaining what might happen. Of course, here you ask yourself, is it the sarcopenia, the, the age-related loss of muscles that kicks in this inability to walk that eventually has a secondary effect on the, on the on primary motor cortex, or there is a loop, but that's something that we don't have to time now to discuss. Then, um, of course, we shifted our um, also attention to the white matter. Uh, it was work by Dave Slater, at the time also a, a, a PhD candidate. Um, and then if you um, give yourself the time to do in, inter individually also some uh, tractography, and then within the tracts, you're looking at the age-related differences in terms of what we interpret, smiling content, iron content, etc. First of all, you see for the majority of, 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 um, um, of um, um, age-related differences, this inverted U-shape or U-shape, uh, which was uh, quite interesting to see also the dynamics of it, even cross-sectional, across tracts and across um, also different uh, contrasts. But also it gave us also the possibility to test some of the um, hypotheses regarding the late myelinating areas being the first one 
uh, also to degenerate what we showed in a sort of simplistic way. That means already here, it's not only the interpretation of um, uh, anatomical changes related uh, to age, but also, let's say, the ability to look at this also in a more neurobiological sense in terms of hypothesis related to different components of these anatomical changes. Um, and then, of course, if you look in a way like this Manhattan plot shows, because we have, of course, lots of different data for these um, individuals, in what domains do we see the strongest correlations between the different tissue properties that we're measuring across the brains of these um, individuals and the different domains is the cardiovascular um, um, here components, each column represents one um, variable, be it systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, cholesterol. And you see they definitely have the major impact on what we call brain's health. And with this um, idea, we were looking actually across um, now two different types of data, the relaxometry data, what uh, Martina described, but also at a naughty type of multi-shell diffusion data. And you see that um, everything what deviates here from the zero across the different tracks that are depicted here in different colors that you see here and, uh, projected on the brain, um, it's actually the cardiovascular risk factors with, which change what we interpret as density of axon coming from the naughty model and myelin content. Interestingly, these effects, which were mainly driven by males, as if females are protected against the effects of, 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 of cardiovascular risk factors. Why? And of course, males have more cardiovascular risk factors, but we corrected for this. We just looked, let's say, at this level, um, and it's interesting. Um, I think, is it a hormonal also um, um, question, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And then what is the last, let's say, topic, what I wanted also to brush over, um, most of the time, it's my impression, we look either at white matter or gray matter, but it's the brain. And here, what Olga did, uh, she was asking, well, if we, let's say, simplify the effects of cardiovascular risk factors and aging just to the vascular component, against a neurodegenerative component. And we say neurodegeneration is much more linked to um, volume changes, be it in the tracts or in the adjacent cortical areas, or microvascular effects on myelin. And you see here, actually, across the different tracts, cardiovascular risk factors are much more affecting the myelin component, both in white matter tracts and adjacent cortical areas, and not that much, actually, this is what we could interpret as neurodegeneration. And here at the end, a sort of quick uh, wrap up. I think, and I'm repeating now, Martina, I think quantitative MRI is particularly important for longitudinal studies. And we can already claim that after first evidence brought by others and us, we can see the meso and micro scale. Uh, brain anatomical differences or changes non-invasively, that we're getting this structure, uh, structure function relationships with this idea of G ratio, conductance velocity, etc. Data quality is important. I was hoping that Martina will talk about prospective motion correction, but obviously the 20 minutes are not long enough. And um, we are seeing the first excellent studies with validation with histology, Parkinson's disease, substantia nigra. Maybe Stefan Lerisi will talk about this later. Um, and with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And I hope there will be one or two questions for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this talk. I'm going to wait to see with Olivier if he has any questions on the chat. Um, there's no questions in the chat yet, but I uh, I would have one question. So uh, you talked about that Natu et, Natu et al. 2019 paper, I think, where you showed that um, the reduction in cortical thickness and development was mostly due to a, to a change in the gray-white matter contrast due to intracortical myelination. 
And so I'm wondering if you think that kind of process might also be happening in aging or in uh, neurodegeneration. So is the loss of cortical thickness might also be driven by a change in the intracortical myelination? Well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's even I would even go a step back because if we look at histopathological studies of aging, okay, they have a restricted number of, of, of observations. You cannot claim something like the UK Biobank or what we are doing in a smaller scale. Um, actually, across the lifetime, we are losing up to maximum 5% of cortical thickness. And the numbers for the white matter are between 30 and 40 percent. That means, and therefore, I really wanted to show in this busy slide at least our first impression about um, the effects of aging are indeed a massive effect of what we interpret as smiling. Of course, in I have personally still uh, um, um, uh, the question in my mind, how actually can we decouple um, in these frameworks that we're working with, again, voxel surface base, the tissue property changes or differences from volume changes or differences? Because if I'm losing myelin, then of course I will be losing also in a way volume right it's, it's it's not a perpetuum mobile type of um of machine therefore i think at the moment i don't have a very clear answer on what you um want to know but i think in this way that we decided many years ago to go that means departing from the i think biologically vague description of cortical thickness of volume and so on but really take the, the thorny path of more difficult concepts, um, as you heard from, from Martina, with the, inter, the implementation in the, in the current analytical frameworks, eventually we will come to a point we can uh, differentiate these processes. Now, if it's more cortical thickness, gray matter, neurodegeneration, against now effects of intracortical myelin or white matter changes, um, I don't know, but I gave you the numbers and I think already there we have a sense of where the money is. I think it's in the white matter when we're talking about aging, definitely. Thank you for this answer, very interesting. So there's one more question in the chat by Antonella Maserolo. So uh, what is your thought to apply these uh, techniques to investigate uh, more biomarkers of neurodegeneration in Parkinson's disease in the population? And so, for example, to improve the early diagnosis um, and possible targeting in more appropriate way, the management of interventions. Well, I, I don't want to steal the, the, the fame from Stefan Lechris because I think he will be talking exactly about this. Um, but what I mentioned, the work by um, Evgenia, Evgenia Kirilina and Malte Bramelo from Leipzig is, is, is really already a um, high-end um, definition of what's happening, particularly for, for Parkinson's disease in the, in the so-called substantia nigra. Very elegant studies with um, imaging, ex vivo experiments, extracting iron, showing the effects also on MR contrast. I mean, groundbreaking work. I think still as a clinician who is also seeing patients with, with Parkinson's disease, I would say for the moment it's a clinical diagnosis, but where, um, 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 where I see indeed eventually a niche, this is monitoring a therapeutic response because we don't have to be that gloomy on uh, the promise of a neuroprotective treatment, now more in Alzheimer's disease, you know, molecules are being developed, tested with bigger or, or, or smaller success. But I think this is the future. First of all, stratifying um, 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 vulnerable populations or at least a risk population. Therefore, again, I, I cannot just repeat myself, but really differentiating the nice blue stream of what we call healthy aging and detect early these deviations in order to introduce treatment. And then, of course, when the treatment is there, 
On the one hand side, we have the clinical impression of what the patient is telling us, uh, what we as doctors see or physios or psychotherapists or psychologists. And of course, it would be good to have this objective biomarker or objective measurement of, of, of therapeutic success. This is, I think, what we will see in the future, definitely. Thank you for your answers. I think we are going to move forward with the trainees now.